Welcome. My name is Jason Dexter and I'm happy to be with you today. We are continuing our study of the book of Revelation and we are in Revelation chapter 12. It's a very interesting chapter that talks about a grand war between the woman and a child and a dragon. Now in this chapter we're going to get a special behind the scenes look at the epic battle between God and Satan that's been raging ever since the devil rebelled. This battle spans millennia. It's waged across the cosmos, both in heaven and on earth. Now, the book of Revelation is largely a description of this war. And in the book of Revelation, we'll see exactly how this war is going to end. And Satan will be judged. Spoiler, God wins. Good triumphs over evil. Now, in this passage, though, we're going to see how people are kind of in the middle of this conflict. People become ensnared in this conflict between God and Satan. Satan will attempt to use people against God just as he originally seduced many angels to join him in this fight. So Satan, he seeks to either seduce or ensnare people outright or target them for destruction. Though he can't hurt God directly, he tries to hurt God, to get at God, by hurting God's creation. So whether you like it or not, you have become embroiled in this conflict. We're going to see how this conflict expands from heaven to earth and then also look at what is our role in this conflict and how does knowing this battle and even knowing how this battle ends, how does that affect us, you and me, today in the 21st century? So we're going to read through Revelation chapter 12. And I'll read through it in three parts. So the first part is in verses 1 through 6. And a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains, in the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for a hundred, sorry, 1,260 days. So this passage has three characters. Uh, first, it has a woman, and then it has a dragon, a great red dragon, and then finally it has a child. So a woman, a dragon, and a child. Now, before we can really understand what's going on, we need to identify who is the woman, who is the dragon, and who is the child. So we'll start with the woman. It says, A great sign appeared in heaven, and a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. Now, there are several clues in this passage as to the identity of this woman. First, though, it's a bit easier to start with who this woman is not. Now, at first glance, you might think that this woman is Mary. After all, she gave birth to the most famous child in all of Scripture. However, verse 6 describes this woman as fleeing into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God and she was nourished there for 1260 days. This does not fit the historical Mary. So, this must not then be talking about Mary. And also in verse 17, there's more of a description of this woman. Verses 13 through 17, they also do not fit Mary. Specifically in verse 17, it says, The dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. So the dragon's not just going after the child, but he's going after all of Mary's offspring offspring. Uh, sorry, not Mary's offspring, but all of this woman's offspring. So basically, th this just really doesn't fit Mary here. So if it's not Mary, then who is this woman? Well, a better explanation is that the woman represents the nation of Israel. Israel is often referred to as her 
in the Old Testament, including in Lamentations chapter 1. The text also gives us more clues that this woman represents Israel. The woman is mentioned as being clothed with the sun and with the moon and on her head a crown of 12 stars. That's remarkably similar to a dream which Joseph records in Genesis 37, 9. Then he, that's Joseph, dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and 11 stars were bowing down to me. So the best place to interpret scripture is other scripture. And Genesis 37, 9 interprets Revelation 12, 1 very well. So there's 12 stars on the woman's head, and that would appear to refer to the 12 tribes of Israel in Joseph's dream also. Uh, actually, Joseph's dream, you'll notice there were 11 stars. Why does it not mention 12? Well, Joseph himself would have been the 12th. He was the 12th tribe. So there were 11 other tribes that were going to bow down to Joseph. So it seems that the 12 stars refers to the 12 tribes. And then this dream also talks about the sun and the moon. Who are they? Well, in the original dream, the sun and the moon are Jacob and Rachel. And they show where the woman, where the nation of Israel came from. The nation of Israel came from the patriarchs. Now, the woman also has a child. It says that she was pregnant, was crying out in birth pains, the agony of giving birth. The woman has a child. Now, the nation of Israel produced the Messiah. Again and again in the Old Testament, God promises that through Adam, Abraham's descendants, that is, the Israelites, a Messiah would be born. A Savior would come. And so we see that that is happening. The woman, Israel, gave birth to the Messiah, and that is Jesus. We also see that throughout Bible and history, Satan hates the nation of Israel. They're God's chosen people, and they have a target on their back. So that explains why we will see this dragon coming against this woman or Israel. Now, the next part is the child. The child is a little bit easier to understand. It says that the child will have a rod of iron in verse 5. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Well, that refers to Jesus, to the Messiah. Revelation 2.27 says, He will rule them with a rod of iron, as when the earth and pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. And also Revelation 19.27, 15. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. So very clearly, the child in this passage refers to the Messiah. And the woman refers to Israel. Now, how about the dragon? Several times this dragon is mentioned. Now, there should be little doubt in our minds who this dragon is. It obviously is Satan. Now, if there's any confusion, verse 9 makes it even more clear. It says, The great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. Okay, so the passage makes it clear for us the dragon is Satan. So what we see here is that Satan, the dragon, is angry with the woman Israel and tries to destroy her and also tries to destroy her offspring. That is the Messiah or Jesus. Uh, we see that the dragon has seven heads with ten horns and seven diadems. In the next chapter, Revelation 13, we'll see that the dragon is will give power to the beast. That is the Antichrist who holds sway over many regions and kingdoms. There will be a ten-king alliance that the Antichrist will rule over and through. That seems to be pictured here by the ten horns. And the seven diadems, uh, diadem is oh, another word for crown. So he's wearing lots and lots of crowns on his head. Basically, it means he will be ruler over the earth. He will declare himself to be the king of kings. Even though, of course, we know that Jesus is the only king of kings. Now, much of Satan's influence in the world is going to be exercised through governments. So behind the scenes, he deceives, he plots, he schemes. 
And what he attempts to accomplish now through subtlety, at that time, he's going to accomplish through brute force and raw power. The dragon will take control of the world, will totally control this alliance of kings and portray himself as the ruler. He will put on the seven diadems and he will say, I am king, I am ruler. Now, this passage shows us a lot into his strategy and into this cosmic war that is raging. We see in verse 4, his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. Uh, this is most likely a reference to one third of the angels in heaven who decided to side with Satan and fight against God. And when these one third of the heavenly host, the angels, chose to side with Satan, then they became demons or fallen angels. And what is the dragon trying to do? It says, that his goal is that when she bore her child, he might devour it. Okay, so his goal is to actually stop Jesus even from being born or to stop to kill him after he is born. So here we see a hint of this cosmic battle between God and between Satan, which has been raging since even before the Garden of Eden. Now let's zoom out for a moment and look at the big picture of this war. In Genesis 1 31 it says, God saw everything that he had made and behold it was very good. It was very good. So when God created the world it was beautiful, it was good, it was perfect. No darkness, no evil. But it didn't take long for things to change. Only a few chapters later, after Adam and Eve rebelled against him, and people's sin had become great on the earth. Genesis 6, 5 and 6 says that the wickedness of man's heart was great, and he thought only about wicked, about evil continually. All the thoughts of his heart were evil. So jump forward in the text to Genesis 12, 3, and God promises that he is going to bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And this is a promise to Abraham. And you, all the families of the earth, shall be blessed. God is going to send a descendant of Abraham to bless the whole earth. And that same promise was actually made in front of the snake in Genesis 3 when God promises that the descendant of woman would bruise the snake on the head. Now Satan is not dumb. Satan knows these scriptures. He is aware of God's plan to send a Messiah. And he also knew that the Messiah would come through God's chosen people, the nation of Israel, the woman. So from the beginning, Satan has attempted to block God's plan by preventing Christ from ever being born. Now, the best tacticians wage war on many levels. Now, Satan, knowing God's plan ahead of time and being the skilled terrorist that he is, has tried to sabotage this plan over and over through the millennia. Now imagine if for some reason there was a terrorist who wanted to stop all the electrical grid, wanted to stop all light, all artificial light on earth. What might he do to, to try to achieve his goal? Well, one way would be to go back in time and try to stop Thomas Edison from ever inventing the light bulb. If he could stop the thing from ever being invented, then he could win before the other side even knew there was a battle going on. So Satan is like that. Satan tried to thwart God's plan of sending Messiah even before the Messiah came. So we're just going to run through a quick... Uh, overview of some scripture to see Satan trying to accomplish this plan. Now in Genesis 2, Satan attempted to corrupt the human race. If mankind is corrupted, and we know that fathers are the one who pass down original sin to their children, how could a perfect savior be born? If the Messiah was a descendant of man, how could a perfect savior be born? Well, God defeated this by the miracle of the virgin birth. So original sin was not passed on to Jesus. Then Satan tried to kill the godly line. He tries to kill Abel. Then God raised up another godly line in Seth. In Genesis 6, Satan attempts to pollute all the bloodlines of the human race 
through the Nephilim and through the fallen sons of God. And God instead sends the flood and preserves one chosen family. Soon after that, uh, after the flood, after the time of Abraham, in the time of the patriarchs, there was a famine which came upon the family of Israel, of Jacob. And it was a life-threatening famine. But God had protected by sending Joseph ahead to Egypt so that all of Joseph's family would be protected. Later on, a few generations later in Egypt, Satan tries to kill all the male Jewish children. If he could kill all the male Jewish children, then no Messiah would be born. It would extinguish all of Jesus' possible ancestors. Well, it didn't work. The midwives disobeyed because they feared the Lord, and the nation continued. Later, the idol-worshipping Pharaoh tried to wipe out all the Israelites when they were on the border of the Red Sea. But God flipped the script, protected his people, and wiped out the attacking armies. Fast forward to the time of Esther. You probably remember the character of Haman. Who is Haman? Haman was an Agagite, a sworn enemy of the Jews, a descendant of the Amalekites. And he tried to exterminate all Jews from the planet. He got so far as to get the Persian king's royal seal of approval to have genocide against all of the Jews. (coughs) But God flipped the script again. He elevated Mordecai to a position of authority. He put Esther into just the position she needed to be in at the exact time, in the exact place, to deliver his people. And in fact, Haman was the one who died and not the Jews. Fast forward again. After Jesus was born, what happened? Remember, the wise men had come to Jerusalem to ask King Herod where this king was going to be born. And King Herod said, another king? Hmm... I, oh yes, I want to go and and worship this king. Sure he did. What he actually wanted to do was kill him. Where did he get this idea? Where did all of these evil people get their ideas? Well, Satan was working behind the scenes. So Herod sent his army and killed all the male children in Bethlehem, two years old and younger. But God had warned Joseph in a dream and Jesus escaped. Now, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, Satan attempted to tempt Jesus and cause him to sin. If he was successful, Jesus could not save us because he would be a sinner. We know Jesus resisted the temptation. Now, finally, when Jesus' ministry was fully accomplished, Satan had Jesus killed. It says that he himself entered into Judas Iscariot in order to betray Jesus. When he was killed, surely Satan was celebrating his greatest victory. Yet his greatest victory turned into his greatest defeat. It was God's plan all along and the method by which he accomplished salvation for all. So we see throughout scripture, the dragon has been after the child. And we can see even in modern era, during World War II era, with Hitler and trying to commit genocide against the Jews. And it's happened again and again and again in history. Satan hates and rages against the nation of Israel. And especially his goal was to prevent Jesus, the Messiah, from accomplishing his mission. So we see Satan, yes, he's a very skilled tactician. But God is greater God is a far greater and more powerful, wiser tactician than Satan is. God told us and also Satan exactly what he was going to do ahead of time. He even declared it to the enemy. He made it public in scripture. And then he made it happen. Using the very responses of the enemy of Satan to further his plan and reveal his sovereign power for all to see. Now, one of the most famous plays in baseball history is when Babe Ruth pointed out exactly where he was going to homer the next pitch. And then the pitcher, of course, would have tried to stop it. And then Babe Ruth hit a home run in the exact place he pointed to, showing that he was in complete control of the situation. That's what God did. 
he pointed out exactly what he was going to do ahead of time. Satan knew it, and he did his best, but he still couldn't stop God's plan. Job 42.2 says, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. No purpose of God's can be thwarted. Okay, so what is the application for us? Well, don't fret and don't worry about circumstances that seem stacked against you. God is sovereign. His perfect plans will be fulfilled both in your life and also in the world. God knows what he's doing. He is a master tactician. He is wise. His plans are going to be accomplished. His promises to you will be fulfilled. Whatever obstacle, whatever difficulty you are facing, God is greater. God is greater than that and he will see you through it. Now we see that the woman flees into the wilderness and then she goes to a special place of protection which God's prepared for her for 1260 days. This is three and a half years. Uh, most likely this is during the second half of the tribulation. So we see that this battle has raged from eternity past. It's going to keep raging all the way into the end times period, the tribulation period, when Satan and his puppet, the beast, the Antichrist, come against the nation of Israel to persecute, kill, wage war against Israel. And here's a promise. God is going to protect his people. He's going to preserve a remnant for them. For the last three and a half years before Jesus returns, all of those who flee to the place God provides will be protected. Even at the very end, God does not allow this dragon to win this war. He will protect his people. Now let's move forward and I'm going to read verses 7 through 12, which shows us this war as it takes place in heaven. It says, Now war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. So there is going to be a clash of the ages in heaven. And we see that Michael and God's good angels will pit themselves against Satan and his horde of fallen angels. Now, someone might ask, why doesn't God just banish Satan and his demons with a word? Why does he need to use angels to fight for him? Couldn't God win this battle with just a word? Well, of course he could. God could win this battle with a word or with a thought. But he chooses to use his angels to fight this war. Why? Well, God can do everything by himself if he chose to. That's true. He doesn't need people to share the gospel. He could... Boom the message from the heavens. He doesn't need angels to take his message to the saints. He could do it himself. The king of kings could have certainly taught his people without the prophets. God could make missionaries and preachers expendable. But God seems to delight in using his created agents, whether people or angels, for accomplishing his purposes, using them as tools. Just as the angels will be called to join this battle, against Satan and the fallen angels. So we too are supposed to be in this battle. We are called to fight against Satan and his demons. We are called to be warriors in God's army. Why? Well, as you fight the good fight, you grow spiritually. 
your faith is increased. And at the same time, you grow more bold and you grow more reliant upon the Holy Spirit. Struggle can help your Christian character to grow. Now, we can assume that like your faith and character grows through struggle and fighting against Satan, so too the angels reap some benefit personally from serving God. This is what they were created to do. So rather than doing everything by himself, God empowers his followers to be his standard bearers. What is the application for us in that? Well, first of all, we can be his standard bearers. We can fight in his battles. That's an amazing privilege. So lift his standard high and wave it proudly as his followers, as his loyal ambassadors. And another thing is that we should learn to be like God. There are certain things that you can do by yourself, but it is good to let others to take part, to give responsibility to others. A pastor should give responsibility to other workers in his church. A parent should give some responsibility and tasks to his children. That is how they grow and how they learn. I was once talking to a parent who said how busy she was doing all the chores and all the housework and all the cleaning and all the cooking and everything, but she had some children. I asked her, why, why don't you uh, let your children help? And she said, well, if they help, I'll be more busy because they will make a mess. And I said, well, in the short term, that's true. It could be more work to give them a job and teach them how to do it. But in the long term, it will be a big help for you if you have some other helpers around the house. So rather than doing everything ourselves, just because we think we could do it better than someone else, we need to give more jobs, responsibilities to others. We need to empower them and entrust some important responsibilities to them. All right, going forward in this passage, we see that Satan is defeated. Satan and his angels fought back, but he was defeated. There was no longer any place for them in heaven. Now, after Satan is defeated, all access to heaven is closed off. So naturally, we ask the question, when? When is this going to happen? It's probably a still future point in time from now, it's future, that will likely take place as we see in this context in Revelation during the seven-year tribulation period. Now, there's an interesting passage in the Old Testament which can give us some more insight into this. It's in Job 1, 6 through 7. It says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the same scenario happens in Job chapter 2. So we see in the book of Job, even after Satan sinned and lost his permanent home in heaven, he still has access to it. The sons of God in these, in these verses are a reference to angels. So Satan is allowed to present himself to God. We can assume that includes other fallen angels can do the same thing as well. Now, we don't know for sure why God still allows this access for now. Perhaps it's a type of mercy toward them, or maybe it's just a method to maintain some kind of communication. Uh, even in Cold War times, the U.S. and the Soviet Union, they had an emergency phone which they could use for back-level communication in emergency. So we don't really know exactly why does God allow even now, Satan, this access, shouldn't he just ban him from heaven completely? But we do see in the book of Job how God uses that access to communicate with Satan and hence to accomplish God's purposes in the book of Job and through the life of Job. So in Revelation, though, we see that this access which Satan has now will not continue forever. There will be a war in heaven, and that's where this widespread battle is going to be. It says, in heaven. And Satan will be soundly defeated, and forever he will lose his access to the throne room of God. 
What happens when he loses this access? Well, verse 12 says he's going to be really, really mad because he knows that his time is short. So it's good for heaven. Satan's locked out, but it's not so good for the earth because Satan is just going to run rampage on the earth with the time that he has left. Uh, verse 10 says, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. So there's a loud voice which proclaims God's victory. His dominion over the entire universe is being established without question. Step by step by step, God is rooting out and winning against all opposition until the final victory when Jesus returns. What is Satan called here? He's called an accuser of our brothers. It reminds us of his nature. If an artist were to paint a portrait of Satan, what would be Satan's go-to pose? Now we've seen, for example, Iron Man's go-to pose, what he does. Well, I think if Satan were to have a portrait drawn of him, it would be with a sneer on his face and a finger pointed in accusation at the brethren. That is his traditional pose. He revealed this in the book of Job when he accused Job before the Lord. And he does the same now. So just a side point, but a very important application I want us to make from this is very simple. Don't be like Satan. Don't be hasty to accuse others, to judge them, to condemn them. If someone were to draw a portrait of you, you wouldn't want them to draw a portrait with you pointing the finger in accusation of others. So we also should not accuse people like Satan did and like he still does. So let's be careful not to be accusers. All right, going forward, it says that they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb. We can, we can conquer this accuser. The strength to do so does not belong to us. You can't fight Satan one-on-one, -on -one, head to head, man on man, and expect to win. You can't win. He's way, way more powerful. It's only possible to overcome him through the strength of Christ. In the book of Acts, there are some guys going around and they're trying to copy Paul and the other disciples and Peter, and they try to cast some demons out of this guy. And the demon says, who are you? I know Jesus and I know Paul, but I don't know you, so you lose. We can't win on our own strength. But Jesus already won the war when he came out of the tomb. So join with him, rely on him, and then you too can win the victory. Now these believers who conquered actually died for their faith. It says they loved not their lives even unto death. They were killed for their faith. So if someone is killed, how can they be described as a conqueror? It looks like they lost. They were killed by the enemy. But martyrdom is not a defeat for believers. Rather, it's a victory. It's a victory to stand firm in your faith until the end. It's a victory to never compromise, to never give up, to never deny your Lord. It's a victory to never give in to the persecution by denying the Lord and joining the world. So, application. How are we going to obey this passage? Well, when you face temptation, temptation to compromise or give in or peer pressure or whatever it is, rely on Christ. Rely on the blood of the Lamb. Look to the cross. It is in the cross that you can have victory. Now, we see in the last part of this passage that Satan is going to be like a cornered dog, or we can say a cornered dragon. He knows his time is short. Once he's cast out of heaven, he realizes the final chapter's in progress, and he has very little time left. What does he do? Does he humble himself and finally plead for God's mercy? No. He doubles down. He continues his scheming. His anger is unleashed even more. So let's come into the last part of this passage, verses 13 through 17. In these verses, we can see the dragon's rage. 
When the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. So Satan is going to lose the war in heaven, and then he's going to turn his attention elsewhere. He can't win against God. He can't win up there. He can't beat Michael. He can't beat the angels. So his attack is going to focus primarily on the nation of Israel, God's chosen people. And it says that he will pursue them, pursue this remnant into the wilderness where they're being protected. But God is going to give the woman two wings of the great eagle. Uh, what does this mean? We, we don't know really what this uh, symbols refer to. Will it be some fleet of helicopters or aircraft or something supernatural akin to the parting of the Red Sea? Or will he just transplant them from one place to another? We don't know. And it doesn't really help to speculate. But the point is that God is going to protect them. Over and over and over in Israel's history, he has protected them against her enemies. Again and again, he preserves them and uh, preserves a remnant of the nation of Israel. And he's going to do the same thing there. God sometimes uses supernatural means and some, sometimes he uses natural means. Either method accomplishes the same result and God still receives the glory. Then it says that the serpent is going to pour water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. Most likely this is figurative language referring to an army that he sends after them. The army is so large that it's like a river gushing out to chase them down. Just pouring out after them. You can imagine the Israelites will be greatly, greatly outnumbered. But it says that the earth came to the help of the woman. And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. God actually has done this miracle before. In the book of Numbers 16, 31 through 33, as soon as he had finished speaking all these words, the ground under them split apart. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the people who belonged to Korah and all their goods. So they and all that belonged to them went down alive into Sheol, and the earth closed over them. They perished from the midst of the assembly. So Moses' enemies who refused to obey God's word were just swallowed up by the earth. A big crack opens, they fall down into it, and then the earth closes, and boom, they are gone. God's done it before. He can do it again. It will be clear who is in charge, the commander of the heavens and the earth, even the earth itself obeys. Imagine if you are a general or a leader in the Antichrist army at this point in time and you have an overwhelming advantage. You're coming in for the kill to totally annihilate these people and then the earth itself swallows up all of your forces. They would probably say, how can we fight against that? And the priests to the Pharaoh of Egypt long before said, this is the finger of God. We can't fight against God. We can't win. There is no winning when you fight against God. Now for the Jews at that time, all of their senses are going to tell them we're doomed. It will seem as if there is no hope. This massive force is after them. They won't have the weapons to resist, but God will fight for them as he's done so many times before. What's the application for us today? Well, sometimes your enemies may seem huge. The obstacles, the challenges, the difficulties in front of you may seem too much for you to overcome. Don't 
worry, but cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. Trusting God that even if that moment you don't see the light, you don't see the hope, you don't see the end of the tunnel, trust and know that he's working. He has proven himself over and over again. Now, when the dragon is unable to get victory over the woman, the earth swallows up his army, it says he's furious. So what does he do? He goes off to make war on the rest of our offspring and on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So the dragon won't be able to beat this protected group inside of this supernatural shield of God near Jerusalem. So the Antichrist, the dragon, they're going to go after all the Jews all over the world. There will still be Jews living in other countries around the world. He's going to try to collect them together and put an end to them. But not only the Jews, he's also angry with all of those who hold to the testimony of Jesus. All real believers, all believers who refuse to take the mark of the beast, they refuse to follow Satan, they are going to be targeted as well. He's going to go after the diaspora of the Jews and believers all over the world. On the one side, this, this time in the future is going to be really, really frightening and really scary to see the world governments going so hard to persecute and kill believers. And many, many will perish. On the other side, it, on the other side it will be exciting because there will be this great battle, this great war, and it will be clear for all to see that God is winning. And God is supernaturally intervening in the conflict to bring about his perfect plan for his people. So I think that this chapter is really encouraging because right now we just maybe see a little piece of this battle going on around us. We might, You might look at your country, your government, you might read the news and you might see, well, everything is going bad. Everything is going chaotic. Things are descending into more and more evil. And I don't even recognize what I'm seeing in society and the world around me. It seems like Satan and it seems like evil might be winning. But remember, he is not. God is the Alpha and the Omega. He wins again and again and again in history. He has done miracles to bring about his perfect desired end. And he's going to do the same thing in the future. So as we continue to go through the book of Revelation, remember, Jesus wins. He wins in this world and he can help you to win in your life. He can help you to overcome any temptations and any obstacles you face. Not by your own power, but by, by the blood of the Lamb. So let's keep looking at the cross and trusting him as we try to study and obey. I hope that you enjoyed this lesson on Revelation chapter 12. I'd invite you to join us next time as we continue in the book of Revelation and next time we will study Revelation chapter 13. It's been a pleasure to be with you today. May God bless you.